Lois Ellen Frank, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I am excited to have a conversation about your um, beautiful new cookbook, and it's called Seed to Plate, Soil to Sky. So maybe you could be in by just telling us what the title means to you, what you wanted to convey. Well, um, we, uh, Chef Walter and I work a lot in Native American communities, and uh, what we have found over time is that uh, Plants are a big part of health and wellness, and many of the diabetes educators and community health representatives and doctors and nurses are really encouraging people, not only in Native communities, sort of all across the globe, let's say, to eat more plants as part of a, a healthy diet, a healthy heart diet, uh, keeping weight under control. And... Um, what we have found is that a lot of people really want to cook plants and they want to eat more plants, but maybe they weren't exposed to them growing up. Maybe they didn't have a mom that cooked a lot of plants. Maybe they had a mom that cooked green beans till they weren't green anymore. Uh, <laughs> and so how would they know how to cook plants? How would they even know the array of the amazing plants? And, um, we decided that we were going to focus on eight plants. So each chapter uh, is one of these eight plants, which I call the magic eight. And as we were thinking about these wonderful plants and really giving um, them the respect and the reverence, let's say, uh, we decided that, you know, the idea of these, the seed to plate, and how the soil helps them grow to sky. And so we came up with this name. And then if you look at sort of the subtitle, Modern Plant-Based Recipes Using Native American Ingredients. So it really is a celebration of these inherently indigenous Native American and American, because some of these ingredients originated uh, in what outside of what is now the United States. But it really is about a celebration of these plants and helping people of all colors and all nations to incorporate these indigenous foods into their diet for health and wellness. Hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. I found myself wondering as I was reading, especially the, the introduction, whether you think of this book and Chef Walter thinks of this book as predominantly for the Native American community to kind of refall in love with its own T-E-K, traditional, um, what is ecological this? Ecological knowledge, T-E-K, very traditional, good. Yep, T -E traditional right. ecological knowledge. Right. Um, or is it more for, you know, outsiders to have an appreciation of, of these uh, indigenous foods or both? It, it actually is both. Um, Chef Walter and I are very inclusive and we believe, um, I always like to use the analogy, um, you know, let's say we're a community living on the river and we're really good stewards of that river. We take care of it. We don't pollute it. But our neighbors to the north don't and our neighbors to the south don't. How much of a mm. difference do we actually make? And so this is really about inclusive. When we talk about sustainability and we talk about the one earth, the one mother that we have, and we talk about health and wellness, this is all people because of every color, uh, you know, the four colors of corn, yellow, white, black, and red, don't, don't come together, right, for this one earth, this one turtle island, this idea of of food sovereignty, this idea of sustainability, this idea of TEK, then we're not making a difference because it has to be, be everybody uh, to help the earth and regenerate the earth and re-indigenize these plants and revitalize them and protect them from genetic modification and uh, use them uh, in food and food dishes for health and wellness. It really has to be mm. everyone. So you, you use the word sovereignty, and your your, your co-author doesn't like that word. No. Well, right? he thinks it's rooted in uh, European, which it is. You know, the original definition, definition, if I were to sort of simplify it, would mean the right to sufficient, healthy, 
culturally appropriate food. Okay. That's sort of yeah. the European definition, but you know, when we look at native communities and we look at, um, what native American food sovereignty is, you know, we can add some other things to that, um, food justice, uh, food security, right. Being not, being scared, where's your next meal coming from? Environmental justice. You can't hunt and you can't plant and you can't harvest and you can't gather foods unless you have an environment that's clean and safe. Mm. Uh, TEK, it's all dependent on TEK. Where to harvest, when to harvest, how to harvest, how does climate or weather changes affect these foods and the harvesting of these foods? And then, you know, the idea that communities um, really can produce and grow and harvest their own food, but also buy those foods from each other. You know, if you have apricot trees and you have hundreds of pounds of apricots and I have an acre of land and I'm growing chilies, you know, you and I can trade. We can um, exchange what we both specialize in uh, to round out our diet, you know, for health and wellness. So it, it really is about um, vendors and growers. And then, you know, this, this whole concept of, uh, a, a native American food sovereignty or a, a food sovereignty in general is the, to reconnect back to the land, to the community, to the culture. And, you know, there's a lot of movements. There's, um, here in New Mexico, we have wonderful Northern New Mexico farmers that are stewards. And, uh, you know, it really is about, um, everybody taking a form of responsibility. You know, one of the things that Walter and I love to contextualize is that everyone is an earth citizen. Everyone is an earth person. And when everybody becomes a member of the earth, uh, indigenous to the earth, we all become stewards and we all have an obligation to take care of that. So we really focus on, on everybody um, reconnecting to their own mm -hmm. indigenous roots, whatever that may be, uh, whatever cultural lineage or earth lineage that is, and then taking responsibility and making a difference so that we have a safe uh, place for food to grow and nourish us uh, you know, for the next seven generations. For, for, for many generations to come. Mm. Yeah, and one of the, the lines that really struck me was this, this motto of one of the food so so sovereignty summits in Wisconsin, which said, how sovereign are we if we can't feed ourselves? And, you know, there's this idea, like, if I, I can't really be sovereign if, I'm not, if, if my community, at least, isn't self-sufficient. So if I, if I have to get up every day and go to a job that I may or may not like, working for a company whose values I may or may not support, who may be, um, you know, objectifying or, uh, you know, um, destroying land somewhere or extracting wealth from, from people around the world, I don't really have a choice if, well, 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 I, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I don't, if I can't feed myself. Right. Like it's that that that's the basis of me being able to say no or yes. There is a choice, um, oddly enough, you know, even as a consumer. Um, so uh, I'll I'll do an example of, you know, me personally. Um, we're doing a training uh, uh, for health and wellness this coming Monday. And um, they want to do a wild rice saute. Traditionally, I would buy the wild rice from native communities that harvested on a canoe um, and that supports them and that supports the indigenous wild rice. However, uh, this is to feed young children and because of uh, the last year uh, where uh, it was very dry and it was hard to get the canoes out. They couldn't harvest wild rice. The price of wild rice went up. So I had to make a conscious decision and I went to several different stores looking for a wild rice mix. Now, most wild rice is patty grown. That's why it's black as opposed to the brownish color. And uh, I ended up, you know, three stores later because I was doing my research uh, at um, natural grocers 
And they had one wild rice, which was one price, uh, which was not organic. Uh, and then they had another, which was a blend of, of different rices that was organic. And the difference in price was 40 cents. And so I made a conscious decision to spend 40 cents more to feed the people in this training to educate them on the difference between rice that was not certified organic, which may or may not be GMO, or rice that was certified organic. Granted, it isn't completely 100% native produced, but it is produced in a very sustainable way and decided to purchase the organic. So by making that decision and spending 40 cents more per pound, I bought four packages, I am a steward, okay, of supporting organic, so no pesticides, non-GMO, because if it's certified organic, it can't be GMO, uh, to buy rice to help feed children in the early childhood uh, training that we're doing on Monday. So am I making a difference with that one decision? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. I am making uh -huh. a difference. I think yeah. I'm making a difference. Maybe, uh -huh. maybe you want to talk about that. So even as a consumer, we have a choice. Do we want to buy, um, you know, uh, organic or commercial? Do we want to support our local farms? I totally support my local farms. I buy, I'm going to farmer's market for this training to buy all the greens and the sprouts and the microgreens, um, you know, or do we want to buy something commercial where people are not paid a fair wage and it's rape and pillage and we're polluting the earth. Um, and so I would advocate if we can afford it, that we make that conscious choice to support the small farms and the organic farms uh, for sustainability reasons and to protect uh, the earth and support mm. those companies that might be a B Corp or have ethics um, as opposed to cutting down the rainforest to grow genetically modified soy. That's another example. Got it. Yeah, I think well, as I'm hearing you, like one of the things that actually feels really good about this cookbook is that it's very down to earth and practical because I've had I've had many conversations on this podcast with thinkers and leaders in the indigenous decolonization movement. And there have been many of those conversations where they keep saying, no, you're asking the wrong question. You're using the wrong language. And, and it's constant, like I can tell, like I'm coming from a, fra a framework that simply is not quite working. And I think this, there, there may be something of that here as well. But when we get down to grind the blue cornmeal, mix it with corn massa flour and water and salt, that we don't have to be, um, fill, I don't have to get it right philosophically if I'm, if I'm making good food from ethically sourced ingredients. Uh, that, I think that's a great uh, realization on your part. Yes, uh, we can, you know, purchase sustainable ingredients and uh, make sustainable choices and then eat good tasting healthy food and feel good about it um you know and you know we've always tried to keep in mind uh, all uh, levels of of uh economics what people can afford what they have access to you know there are certainly many food deserts which would mean if you live in an urban area or a very remote area, what do you have access to? So, you know, we made some very conscious decisions of, um, with those uh, um, criteria and factors in mind, you know, um, and uh, that's what we're, we're helping to promote and helping to advocate. Great, great. Shall we talk about food? Oh, yeah, I love food. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I'm glad <laughs> this would be a terrible time in life to realize that wasn't true. Yeah. So the, fir the first food group is corn. And you have a line that really took my breath away, <clears throat> which is the miracle of corn is that it grows only with the interaction of humans. Yes. And I, I was thinking of that as kind of a downside, like, well, it was this wild grain and people came and, you know, stamped all over it and, and you know, manipulated it. And 
you're you're putting a very different spin on that. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it means that you know, as human, we have to have a relationship with this food because it can't grow without us. It's it's an annual. It is dependent. It can't pollinate uh, on its own. It needs help with uh, the pollination. And so um, it is actually, you know, a wonderful thing that we can have a relationship with this corn and save its seeds and um, really revere uh, how it can have um, nutrients you know, it can feed you in a physical way, a sustenance way, but it can also feed you in a very spiritual way. And um, it's a fairly magical plant. It really is a, mm. a fairly magical plant. And I'm not talking about, you know, just the genetically modified corn that's being grown uh, either to feed cattle or for corn, uh, you know, um, high fructose corn syrup. I'm talking about the blue corn that grows in the desert with elongated roots or the beautiful Seneca white corn that grows to feed many um, East coast tribes and how, you know, it's mounded as opposed to here in the Southwest where we, we waffle so that there's water for this corn. Um, it's pretty amazing that it's been able to adapt uh, to its environment uh, and produce um uh, food. I, I love corn. I love the blue corn that grows here in the Southwest. Uh, but, you know, I also use the white corn that's grown here uh, as well. You know, we have different, um, uh, yes, uh, what was it? Two, uh, earlier this week, we did a, a beautiful organic white corn hominy, the hominy dish uh, from the corn chapter, the pozole, we call it pozole here in New Mexico, just to confuse people. But pozole hmm. is really hominy corn in all other parts of the United States, but we used an organic white corn pozole and we added red chili and azafran and it was delicious. It was um, pure and simple. And so all hominy corn, just, you know, for your uh, listeners to be able to understand is a treated corn. It's an ash corn or a nixtamalized corn as opposed to- I was, was going to ask you how to pronounce that. <laughs> right. So nixtamalization or nixtamalizing means you're using ash to uh, boil the corn and then loosen the skin. And then that skin comes off. And then that corn that's left on the inside, if it's dried whole, becomes hominy or pozole. If it's ground, it becomes masa harina or masa that's used for tortillas or tamales. So uh, there's also corn where you grind the whole kernel. So that would include, you know, all the, the skin and all the other parts. And that's used a lot in baking or the mushes that we do. So different uh -huh. uh, applications. Gotcha. And so can, when you talk about like the, the hominy or the pozole, is that a, a corn product that people can make themselves? Is, is that too, you know, or, is, or would you recommend just buying, you know, so we, malized corn? We did include a recipe of how to do it. I did test it multiple times with different kinds of ash. Uh, you can make it yourself. It is, it is laborious, but it is really exciting to do. So, uh, you know, for those people that can't or don't want to, it is totally accessible and you can buy it uh, online or in stores um, uh, to use in the recipes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that, that struck me about that sentence that I quoted back to you is, you know, I've, I've spent a long time sort of hanging out with the permaculture community that, that kind of has a, they look down a little bit on annuals, right? It's like, you know, you got to spread, you know, you got to weed and do all this stuff and it's not really natural. But when I think about, the, you know, when you talk about being in a relationship with it, like I can't think of, you know, these growers, these vast growers of, you know, fields of corn or, or anything that, that, you know, almost everything that I eat is an annual, right? I don't think of them as thinking that they are in relation with a plant, that, that you know, that they're the owners of it. It's a commodity. But this idea of, OK, it doesn't grow without me. That means I owe it something and it owes me something. There's a kind of reciprocity that's very different from the way I think about annuals. Right. So I'm going to reframe that for you and say that uh, 
annuals are like um, families. So uh, corn, beans, and squash, uh, all of which are annuals, um, are a family. They like to grow together. They want to grow together. Uh, we have to have a relationship with them. They will nurture the soil. So it's permaculture at its best because beans give nitrogen, corn needs nitrogen, squash has big leaves, which shades the ground, keeping out uh, weeds and keeping moisture in, especially in arid or desert environments. And then if we plant them together and we allow them to be the family that they want to be, then in return, they provide us and those three and those three alone with almost every nutrient known to sustain human life. We could pretty much live off those three and those three alone. So when we make a relation with, when we become part of that family, we nurture that family. We are the parents, let's say. We're having a relationship mm. with that family. And in exchange, they provide uh, nutrients um, for us. And I don't know if you've ever gone out and harvested a squash or harvested an ear of corn or harvested beans, but um, it, it, it's for, for me, at least it's completely joyous. You have your basket and you're putting these things in the basket and you're feeling rewarded for the relationship that you had with these plants for that whole season. Tomatoes are very much like that as well. Um, you know, I'm a big perennial fan and I have in my front yard uh, what we call an edible landscape. So I have choke cherries and I've got wild currants and I've got um, uh, yucca and all of these come back every year. I do help them by uh, what I would call acceptance gardening. So I accept what uh, nature has, but I help it. I water it. Um, I... Uh, trim it, you know, and, and in response, I harvest approximately 33 pounds of choke cherries from my front north side of my house every year. And then I make choke cherry juice and choke cherry syrup from that. So I am a, a big fan of um, an edible landscape as opposed to grass, which I think does nothing and doesn't, uh -huh. uh, uses <laughs> up water that other plants could have. But when I plant my annuals, uh, I also have a relationship with them. And I find that relationship extremely valuable and extremely rewarding. Um, I don't, I don't know if I would use the word own. I would use the word, um, in a relationship with like a family, like I have a brother and a sister. I don't own them. Yeah. They're my family. And so I think of the plants more like that. You yeah. don't own yeah. them, but you are in a family with them. All right. Well, also, like, there's if I go to the store and buy burpees every year, that's kind of, you know, I've paid for them. That's a little different than, and, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're wonderful. They're disease resistant. They're water, whatever. But they're also hybrids, so they're not going to produce offspring. Like this, it was different when we planted, you know, our um, our beans and we let them, we let a bunch of them dry. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, which which ones are we going to plant next year? Like, I don't have to go. Back. Like, you know, it was a dollar forty nine. Like, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't like you know, like I'm Bill Gates or something, a you know, financial genius. But there was something really special about choosing this little jar of beans that we're going to get planted next year. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to say I, I never use hybrids. I, I, I do on occasion. I'm, I'm more of a fan and more of an advocate for uh, heirlooms, you know, where you could save the seeds and plant them. They're not sterile. Uh, you know, hybrids were introduced by seed companies because they wanted you every year to go back and buy those seeds, which, okay, brilliant on their part. But uh, I think in native tradition and, you know, the ancestral tradition of some of these very sacred plants, it's always been about planting them and then keeping some of those seeds for next year so that you have yeah. them and they're safe. And, you know, seeds were a form of commerce, right? We could trade seeds. You have this really neat uh, 
um, you know, uh, uh, black and white bean, like a cattle bean or an Anasazi bean. And I really want that bean. And I grow a really, really nice form uh, of a um, heirloom black bean. And so you and I could trade seeds and then we could mm. yield both of those plants the following year. Yeah. And in answer to your question, I have harvested beans. I have harvested squash. The raccoons have always beat me to the corn. <laughs> I, have, I have not, in 20 years, I have not pulled a ear of corn that was worth eating off of a stalk. Oh, uh, well, I guess they need to eat too, and corn is delectable. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so the, the next one I think I want to talk about is, um, is squash. And just, just looking at the picture in the cookbook of all those different kinds, like if I go to the supermarket, I can get zucchini, I can get yellow squash. In the, in the fall, I can get butternut, acorn, and you know, some place will have a big cardboard box of like ornamental squashes. <laughs> that, that aren't, you know, they don't even think we're supposed to eat those, they're just pretty. Oh, but, the gourds, you mean a gourd as opposed to... A gourd, right. Or even like, you know, the, the sort of, you know, the big ones, the, yeah, they're, but they're all, you know, they're food too, if you want. But when you, when you show like the, this, the varieties of all these different kinds of squashes that are available if you grow your own. It's pretty, right, but, it's pretty you know, exciting. Our farmers market has all of these and uh, some of our supermarkets uh, you know, have, uh, especially during the winter, that's why we tried to delineate between winter squash, where you don't eat the outside. Uh, that would include your acorn and your butternut and your kabucha and, uh, you know, your um, spaghetti squashes, the delicata, and then the summer squash, which would be the zucchini, uh, the yellow squash, the green striped or Mexican squash, you know, those would be uh, eaten more in the summer. Um, you know, most supermarkets, you can get them all year round, but those would be the seasons, let's say. Mm -hmm. And by the way, what, one of the innovations that I'm so excited about is the, 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 the photo of the, uh, the different squashes on the skewer, where it's not these, like, I always did it in chunks. And so it, inevitably something would burn, something would be raw inside and something would fall off into the grill and you have done, it almost looks like deli cuts of deli meat. So that, <laughs> so that each skewer goes through each tongue of zucchini or summer or, or yellow squash, like four or five times. Right. And it's very, it cooks very quickly. It's delicious. Yeah. It's really nice. Yeah. Where'd you get that? Did you invent that? Or is that a thing? Oh, uh, we, yeah, I, I'm with you on, you know, putting the, little pieces on the skewer and they rotate or they fall off or they don't cook. And so this cooks very quickly. Uh, it's very delicate. It's not that hard to do. Uh, it's beautiful and it tastes good. Great. Any, anything else from the squash chapter that you kind of want to highlight? Is a, oh, uh, I love squash. Uh, I, you know, the, the pumpkins, you know, the, some of the, the sweet, uh, recipes. Um, the scones are delicious. The uh, pumpkin pinion nut cake, very easy to do. And, you know, the pumpkin pie with a, a pinion pecan crust, you know, a lot of more and more people are having gluten issues. And so we tried mm. to do quite a few gluten free recipes uh, to accommodate that and uh, make room for people to be able to enjoy things without uh, saying, no, I'm gluten free. Gotcha, gotcha. And yeah, and I just want to just throw in that the, the photos are as beautiful as I'm sure the food tastes. Is it, uh... Well, we did all the food <laughs> photography. So uh, we have... How many, a, how many, how how many pictures do you take? Yeah, how, I'm curious, like how many shots do you take? For to when to get one that one that can go in the book, like. <laughs> so we do a lot of times. We'll do variations, you know, uh, like the um, the pumpkin pinion nut cake. And you know, we photographed the whole thing, and then after we photographed the whole thing, we cut slices and we did several different platings of those slices. So you know, uh, each recipe. Uh, what I will say is, you know, after we photographed it, we 
ate everything. So uh, we <laughs> planned our lunches, our photo shoot lunches, so that we would have balanced meals. Uh, with so we ate everything that we photographed in the cookbook and shared it with neighbors and friends and uh, tasters and uh, take home. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. So. Uh, all right. So um, chilies are interesting, um, and I've discovered. You know, uh, my family and I moved to Spain this past year. Yeah. And. I was shocked at how unspicy the food is here. Um, so, and but they use a lot of peppers. They have, you know, they have these um, um, pepper, like pepper tapas dishes where they, they, they look really spicy, but they turn out to be very sweet. Um, it seems like different cuisines have very different opinions about what makes the right pungency of a pepper. Well, yeah, that's interesting that you find, you know, Spanish food uh, not spicy. Um, in order to get the health benefits from the chili, you don't necessarily need heat. I'm a, a little bit more of a savory than a very picante. I know Chef Walter doesn't like heat at all. Uh, but, um, you know, occasionally it's a little bit of spice for me is is nice, you know, here in New Mexico, our state question is red or green. So we definitely <laughs> are asking you, which chili do you want? Because you're going to get one or the other. But um, uh, I think savory is good. And we don't necessarily need to be using, you know, those really, really hot chilies. I, I, we didn't really include uh, any, you know, of the ghost chili or the habaneros. You know, they're just really, really spicy um, yeah. certainly, you know, some cuisine. So, you know, I, I think the, the uh, cuisine of this area, while it can get very hot, doesn't necessarily have to be hot. So we really tried to focus on not burning the palate and doing, um, savory, uh, versions of, uh, many of these, uh, chili infused recipes. Yeah. And I have to say, I went through for maybe a three year period of like, wanting to like grow and find the hottest sauces and looking back it really it really was kind of a macho thing like i really didn't enjoy the food i was eating so much it was it it, it didn't feel like a partnership with the food it felt like me trying to overcome it so i really yeah. i really like this idea like let's we don't we have nothing to prove here we're just trying to you know all kind of get along and have fun right right exactly yeah uh, so, um, I think we've got, uh, you know, five left. What, what would you like to talk about? I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you lead. Oh gosh. You know, tomatoes, I think one of my, um, I included for the first time in a cookbook and I've been doing this for quite a long time is, uh, I make an heirloom tomato sauce. So at our farmer's market, if, the farmer has tomatoes that are overripe or dented, maybe bruised a little. They sell them for less and they're perfect mm -hmm. for tomato sauce. So I buy the less cost uh, tomatoes that are dented or ripe. And I just, you know, every week for about four weeks here uh, in this, um, you know, eco zone in uh, northern New Mexico, it it's usually starts at the end of August, beginning of September, and kind of goes all the way through. Although sometimes I could start in, in August. And I uh, can approximately 150 pounds of tomatoes a week. I do several hundred jars. And then I use those jars in my catering company throughout the year. So the heirloom tomato sauce is something. And, you know, I think the, the art of canning is fading. A lot of people mm. aren't doing it as much anymore. But it is uh, pretty amazing because then it right now we're, you know, in February, I can whip out a jar of my heirloom tomato sauce, which is perfectly ripe, organic, <clears throat> locally grown, uh, anywhere from yellow to orange to green to red tomatoes and make some sort of delicious dish in the middle of winter when most people, uh, if they are eating tomatoes, they're eating very mealy tomatoes that are not uh delectable yeah. and delicious. So uh, I think that's uh, a big thing, <clears throat> this idea of seasonality. 
um, either extending the season through freezing or canning or drying um, and enjoying foods in their perfect season. You know, the um, cherry tomato and arugula or the um, heirloom tomato salad, you know, buying perfectly. I mean, now is not the time to make that salad. That salad mm -hmm. is best in summer. And then you savor and enjoy uh, the season and the plants that, um, you know, are naturally ripened during those seasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, is, and is, potatoes is there, are a is... staple. You know, we uh, obviously had to cut down and pick our favorite potato recipes. Potatoes can be used in a million different ways. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, they're amazing from a stew to, uh, you know, a, a sweet potato masa or a tamale or um, just a perfectly baked potato. I think the herb roasted potatoes are one that's um, very, 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 we use that a lot at Red Mesa. Uh-huh, right. Um, I'm curious whether, um, is, is there any canning of any sort in TEK or was it all seasonality? Well, uh, you know, uh, canning is a, 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 a European method uh, for extending uh, the season, but native people did have um, what your listeners might know of as a root cellar. So they would dig down or they would have an adobe house uh, and store their uh, melons or their uh, squashes or their dried corn in those, uh, you know, earthen houses or, or, or dug down uh, to extend the season. You know, squash could winter over uh, to as late as May and certainly dried corn, uh, you know, um, could winter over for months and months and months. So, you know, the idea of extending the season has always been a part of um, uh, an indigenous way of being, uh, you know, to make sure that uh, food or food security uh, was there because, you know, certainly during the winter, it's very difficult to have, you know, fresh things. We do have, you know, some sprouts and microgreens and lettuces now that can be grown inside, but there was always methods uh, for extending the season. I think now I can, I freeze and I dry. Those are probably the mm -hmm. biggest methods that I use. Right. Yeah. And I guess for people who are scared of canning, you know, for botulism or whatever, I think I think the tomato is one of the safest ones because of its high acidity. Right? It does have high acidity and you can tell right away whether it's sealed or not. You could actually hear the, the jars popping. I do a, a water bath canning process. So I actually take the sauce and make it and put it in the jars and then uh, boil those jars for about 45 minutes, let them rest. Uh, and then uh, we, our water here is very um, uh, uh, hard. So we have lots of minerals. So I have to take, you know, white vinegar to wipe off the minerals that have collected on the outside of the jars. But other than that, uh, for me, that is a very safe method. And, um, uh, you know, the rule of thumb is one season, but, you know, those jars could last longer than one season if you had to. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Well, do you have any photos of your like you know, hundreds and hundreds of jars sitting there? <laughs> no, I don't. I actually, you know, they're in their little canning boxes and, you know, raised off the, the floor and stacked in our uh, uh, cool. We have a, a cold storage closet that we put food in. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, so uh, from tomatoes to potatoes. So you talk about them as the buried treasure. Yes, they, they're amazing. You know, I, I think uh, one of the um, most underrepresented is the sweet potato, you know, and um, the stats on sweet potatoes are amazing um, in terms of health and nutrition. Uh, I'm going to read you some stats because sweet potatoes are amazing. So here's 10 health benefits, improves digestion, promotes uh, healthy weight, uh, 
treats inflammation, boosts the immune system, relieves asthma, treats bronchitis, reduces arthritis, treats stomach ulcers, prevents dehydration, and controls diabetes. And so, and I, that doesn't mean those sweet potato fries that everybody's like, well, but I'm, you know, I'm eating a sweet potato in, in you know, fried in oil with lots of salt. Um, so, you know, I've started to try and incorporate the sweet potato into soups and bowls and, you know, different things um, for uh, health and wellness. They're just um, amazing. They're really, really healthy. But all potatoes are healthy. Uh, they give you, you know, really good carbohydrates. And um, uh, but the sweet potato is a, sort of one of those buried gems that if we can incorporate a little bit more into our diet where it's, it's going to be uh, good for us in the long term. Yeah. And I've grown sweet potatoes almost by accident, you know, and there's always like, you cannot harvest all the sweet potatoes. There's always going to be another huge <laughs> root under there. Ah, uh, that's great. So, yeah. So I love, I love the, the, the look of the, the mash. Right. It looks like one of the, like the simplest thing you could possibly do with like five yeah. ingredients. Yeah. All you do is like cut them, right? poke holes in the potatoes and, <laughs> and yeah. bake them and then just uh, peel them and add some other stuff. And this looks right. fabulous. Yeah, it's good. It's delicious. Yeah. yeah. So I, mean, I've, I have a, a friend who introduced me to I think they were like the Japanese sweet potatoes, the purple oh, ones. I love those. He sprinkled cocoa powder on it, had me close my eyes, and I thought I was eating brownies. Delicious, yes. Yeah. The Japanese sweet potato are amazing. And, you know, uh, you know that brings up another really interesting, uh, you know, when we think about health and wellness. But, you know, uh, National Geographic did these blue zones, and um, they've started to uh, – there's now a, a new series that we can watch. I think it's called The Blue Zones. I think it's four episodes. But it talks about these areas – where people are living well past 100. Why are they living past 100? And one of the areas, one of the episodes uh, is um, Okinawa, Japan. And everybody thought it was the diet of rice and fish, but it's not. It's the Japanese sweet potato. And mm -hmm. um, another area was Loma Linda, California. And they were like, why are people living so long here? Uh, and it's the Seven Day Adventists. And it's because they're eating uh, a, a plant-based diet. And um, so, you know, the more plants, the more plant forward we can be and the more plants we can incorporate into our diet, uh, the healthier and the longer we're going to live. So there is evidence now. Uh, science is starting to say more and more plants, guys, more and more and more and more. So, uh, you know, we really um, try and encourage people to add um, we call it eat the rainbow. And I don't mean the colored candies, because now they're using that term, eat the rainbow. Uh, what I mean is eat the rainbow uh, with plants. And um, your uh, your meal should not just be brown and white. Your meal should be uh, other colors, yellows and reds and greens and purples and uh, browns and whites and, uh, you know, uh, just all these different amazing blues and yeah, purple. I just, um, the more color, the healthier it is. And the colors come from the plants. Yeah. I think, I think food, food marketers understand that, right? That's why the uh, Skittles and M&Ms look so good to us. Cause <laughs> <laughs> we're supposed, you know, you, you look at a cornucopia of, of fresh pr plants and we're supposed to think that's good. That's what, where it's at. Right. Right. Yeah, so we don't want to eat the rainbow with the M and M's and the Skittles. Yeah, that that we want to uh, not be the focus. We want to definitely uh, do it through um, you know different plants, yellows and oranges. Oh, just color, 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 color. Yeah, right on. So, so another whole category is vanilla, and mm -hmm. I have to admit, I did I did not realize vanilla was of Native American origin. I thought it was you know Madagascar or Ceylon or where, wherever. I Tahiti, that's, that's Indonesia, cinnamon, yeah. Cinnamon. So um, vanilla is grown now uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, vanilla is another really special plant. Uh, first of all, it's the smallest seed in the world. Uh, second of all, um, it has uh, it comes from an orchid, and it's only fertile for anywhere from four to twenty-four hours. 
And so here in the Americas, there's a special bee that knows when the vanilla is fertile and it fertilizes the plant. In all other parts of the world, they have to use what represents either a hummingbird, like a hummingbird beak or a bee uh, to hand pollinate vanilla. And that's why vanilla is so expensive because they don't have the indigenous bee in Madagascar or Tahiti uh, to fertilize the vanilla. So it has to be hand pollinated, uh, which makes it very costly to do because you, you have to have human, human to do that. Hmm. Can you buy Mexican v vanilla? I've never seen Absolutely. it. Absolutely. 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 Yep. Huh. Just I mean, the other... Mexican vanilla and it'll come up. Yep. And it's delicious. Right. Yeah. It's delicious. I mean, you know, I mean, the thing that really struck me is like, this is one, um, you know, like it almost felt like, like inbred royalty. Like, like <laughs> yeah, we have to do so much. Like the plant is so helpless. It, it can't grow on its own. It needs to lean against a, a, a tree or something. Right. It needs to be pollinated and is very like this. This is a plant with requirements. Yeah, but it's also the rewards. Uh, you know, vanilla is one of the most prized, uh, and that's why they, they make a synthetic version, um, essences in the world. Mm. There's I've vanilla never... candles and vanilla scents yeah. and vanilla, 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 but true vanilla, I think. Mm. I love the vanilla bean paste. I use that a lot, but also the extract. Uh, it's just amazing. Hmm. Yeah. It's funny that, you know, the, the word vanilla is a synonym for like ordinary, plain, bland. <laughs> I'm not sure, yeah. I'm not sure where, where, that, uh, where that came from. Yeah, uh, it, it's certainly amazing. I think one of my most favorite recipes uh, is the um, vanilla grilled peaches. That is really, really tasty, but also the vanilla and the cacao sunflower skillet cakes. Those are amazing because they'll last for a couple of days and you can eat them like energy bars. They're really easy mm. to make and very, very nutritious and delicious. So, gotcha. uh, you know, I'm that, noticing that, go ahead. I was gonna say, and that, you know, naturally morphs into uh, cacao and we call vanilla and cacao the sweet sisters because you rarely ever see vanilla without cacao or cacao without vanilla. They sort of go hmm. uh, hand in hand. So we call them the sweet sisters because uh, most um, desserts or um, uh, chocolates, chocolate dishes, chocolate desserts have vanilla in it as well. Hmm. Well, and, and but ne neither of those is like sweet though. When I think about things that I grew up eating that were chocolate or vanilla flavored, they were, they were mostly sugar. <laughs> Right. right. How, 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 how did, um, you know, na native cuisines make this stuff palatable? <laughs> you know, chocolate is very bitter and vanilla is just, you know, subtle. Right. It is subtle. Um, well, uh, you can use sweeteners like agave or maple. Um, those would be natural indigenous sweeteners uh, to the Americas. You know, we do have access now to sugar when we grill a peach or we grill a pineapple. Uh, or we take a strawberry and dip it, those fruits naturally have their own fructose, their own natural mm. sugars. So the, the chocolate, you know, the rule of thumb is the darker the chocolate, the more bitter it is, the less sugar it has, but the healthier it is. You know, it's got those flavonoids and it's got all those nutrients. So I think there's a balance between um, very sweet. I personally am not a big sweet sugar person. I like my desserts more on the savory side. Uh, you know, so again, this is going to reflect uh, those tastes. And uh, on uh, earlier this week, we did a um, indigenous food class at IEI. It was right before uh, Valentine's Day. And so we did the, um, the dark chocolate tort, which we served with the coconut whipped cream and the uh, chocolate sauce. And people went crazy uh, you know, and then when we were taking the, the tort out of the pie pan, you know, some of that delicious, um, gluten-free 
crust, which is made from pecan and pine nuts, uh, fell off. And so we took uh, that in a spoon and then drizzled that on top of the chocolate cake. And it was uh, Valentine's Day heaven for everyone that ate it. So it was really, wow. really good. Yeah, really, really good. <laughs> So th there is one ingredient listed in as part of the chocolate section that might be my favorite line from any cookbook ever, and it's four perfectly overripe bananas. Uh -huh. I, I love that so much because it's it's this <laughs> it's it's such a uh, uh, a contradiction, right? But I I, I understood it in, instantly what you meant, and I started thinking like, in what ways am I perfectly over something? <laughs> like it just it just felt very very validating. I can't tell you why. Well, most people would tend to toss the what I consider perfectly overripe bananas out, uh, but these are the ones that you want to freeze, and these are perfect for that chocolate and ice cream or you know a lot of times we'll do the berry and ice cream which was the alternative in there you know you could do it with blueberry if you didn't want chocolate in there uh i uh, we do another one which we call chunky monkey and we add the chocolate chips with the um peanut butter oh it's delicious it's um it's a dairy free delectable uh version of perfectly overripe bananas <laughs> so it's great yeah Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, anything you want to talk about that I haven't asked before we say goodbye? Uh, you know, I just want to really um, sometimes, you know, when you think about health and wellness, uh, it becomes overwhelming. Um, but there's ways to make baby steps to maybe stop drinking a high sugary soda or um, you know, something that is, uh, fried, you know, like in the, the chip or uh, snack family and really take small steps, you know, in, uh, one of the recipes, you know, we peeled the skin off the potatoes and I was like, well, we can't waste those skins. Just put those skins in the oven and make them really crispy. And you have your own little, mm, you know, yummy, crunchy <laughs> snack. And so, you know, I think, uh, Chef Walter and I are zero waste. We're very conscious of waste as chefs. We're very conscious of the cost of food. Uh, we want all people, all colors, all ages to be healthy. And, um, you know, we really want to honor and revere the wisdom of the ancestors and pass on. And that's why it's so beautiful that you actually read the cookbook, because I think when you read it, it brings an educational factor into what you eat. And, you know, the reason education is knowledge is because once you have it, you have a choice, you can ignore it or you can embrace it and use it throughout your life. And so we really want to encourage people to um, become stewards and be sustainable and be healthy and uh, honor um, the foods of the ancestors, but also the earth so that we have all of these things for future generations. Yeah. I, you know, cause I, I hear so much about so much indigenous wisdom is lost, has been lost, is being lost, but there's something about the seeds and the plants that are kind of like, it's still in there, in their DNA. Yeah. And it feels like as, as we d rediscover it, and honor those plants, we can kind of read like, like indigenous wisdom was created at some point. It, it didn't, you know, it wasn't dropped from the heavens. It was created by people living in the land. There's no reason to think that if we develop this respectful, um, you know, mutual relationship with these plants that we can't get it again. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. So tell people the name of the cookbook again, where they could find it and how they can follow you if they are interested. Okay. So it's seed to plate, soil to sky, uh, modern plant-based recipes using Native American ingredients. Uh, it's available pretty much everywhere, booksellers, uh, um, online, our website, uh, cooking schools, stores, um, we are on uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram. Uh, the name of our company is Red Mesa Cuisine. So you can follow us 
on both of those. We, you know, we try and post regularly, or although both Chef Walter and I are not millennials, so it's a little harder. So uh, be patient <laughs> if we're not posting every day and every minute of every day. Uh, we're working chefs, so we are working a lot. But we would uh, love you to, you know, like us and follow us and reach out. We also have a website, which is www.redmesacuisine.com. You can see okay. some spell, videos. Spell, me, spell Mesa. M-E-S-A. So red, R-E-D-M-E-S-A-C-U-I-S-I-N-E.com. Red Mesa. Beautiful. Awesome. Awesome. And I'll put links to those in the show notes. Okay. And it's a, it's a beautiful cookbook. It's a, uh, it's an heirloom cookbook. I think it's oh. one you're going to want to, you're going to want to get the, uh, the original hardcover. Um, I don't, I don't think it's, I mean, I don't have it. I'm uh, cause you know, I'm here in Spain. So I got everything though digitally and I'm, I'm sad that I can't oh. take it into the kitchen and fold it and get stains on it. Yeah. Uh, but my next trip to the States, I'll, I'll, I'll pick one up and schlep it back with me. Okay. Oh, Howie, thank you so much for having me on your show. Oh, what a pleasure. What a fun conversation. Now I'm hungry. It's, it's eight o'clock <laughs> at night here and I don't, I don't have any of I don't have anything cooked. So I'm going to, I think I'm going to microwave some potatoes and, and try something. Okay. Thank you. Lois Ellen Frank, thank you so much for all you do and for taking the time today. Okay. All right. Bye, everyone. Take care. <laughs>